What's going on guys? We're having a great day today. Today we're going to continue our discussion in the book of Job and we're going to be in chapter 25 today and it's only six verses. And in this chapter, Bildad is going to speak to Job. And this is actually the last speech that Job's friends give him other than when Elhu comes into the picture. And we must remember at the end of Job chapter 24, remember how Job said that if you have found any error in my speech, make it known to me, right? If you have found any foolishness in it, show me it. And here when Bildad responds to Job, he does not acknowledge Job's arguments. So I think in a sense, Bildad is conceding to the fact that Job is right, that the wicked man may prosper in his life, and that Job's tribulation is not evidence of a sin in his life. So instead, Bildad rotates the argument, and he kind of touches on a place that we've seen in the past in the book of Job, where he just is going to expound on the fact that all men have sinned before God, and that God is holy, and that no one can be justified before God. And this is a great truth that is important for us to, to think about and to meditate upon and to ponder. But we must also understand that Job is not guilty of sin in, in this regard of being punished for it. So while Bildad's speech is true, we must acknowledge and understand that it comes sort of out of a place of hostility against Job. So if we read Job chapter 25 verse 1 through verse 6, the Bible says this, Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies, and upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not, yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm? So again, we see in verse 1 that Bildad the Shuhite is the one answering Job here. And just as a general discussion of, of this short chapter, I believe it points out the fact to us that religion does not save. You see, Bildad speaks about mankind's inability to be right before God. The whole problem with the religions of the world today is that they try to make themselves right to God. They think, if I can do this and that, you know, if I can outweigh my bad deeds with my good deeds, then maybe God will have mercy upon me. Maybe if I do what, what I think is good, if I do what I think is right, and I try to be a good person, if I give enough alms, if I fast enough times, if I discipline my body enough, then maybe God will have mercy upon me. But you see, the fact of all the religions of the world that proclaim this, that they can make themselves right with God through their, their good works, through their religious deeds, they fail to understand the true holiness of God. And they fail to understand the true sinfulness of man. You see, our sins are innumerable. You see, we, may not, we may, may not be able to count our sin, but God knows them all. We may not know every single idle word that comes out of our mouth, yet God understands them. God understands all of our sin. He understands all of our folly. He understands all of our wickedness. And we saw even in the last chapter, right? While man tries to hide himself in the dark, while man tries to do his wickedness in the cloak of night, God sees them all. So the, fu the fact that the religions of the world try to make themselves right with God, through acts of religion, through acts of quote-unquote righteousness, through acts of following their own heart or creating a, a, their own God in their own mind. It's all folly. It's all foolishness because they don't understand the true nature of God. And in this short chapter, I, I believe Bildad is pointing to this. He's pointing to the holiness of God, the glory of God, the majesty of God, and the utter futility of mankind. And that should always draw us to Christ in humility, knowing that we are frail, that we are weak, that we are sinful, and that we have need of a Savior in Christ. For upon our own feet we cannot stand because we have sinned against God. See, Bill out here points or paints this grand picture of the infinite difference between man and God, and we would be wise to acknowledge and to take counsel from it. So if we look at verse 2, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Dominion and fear with God. See, dominion is the rule of God, right? Dominion belongs to God. It is not saying that God just possesses. It is very, it is God's very nature to have dominion. It is his very nature to rule over all of his creation. See, God reigns forever without end. God has no rival. God has no equal. No one can measure up to the almighty God. It is with him. It is his very nature to rule over all of his creation. And if we look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 through verse 8, obviously in the book of Revelation we see a lot of things just pointing to the glory of God. 
But in the very first chapter, it points a very special picture talking about Christ, right? Jesus Christ, which is the Son of God, God in the flesh. Through the Holy Trinity, He is God. Yet there is only one God. And it says in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh to the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And then Jesus here says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. He has no rival, no equal. He, he has no beginning. He has always existed. He is eternal, and he will have no end, and his reign will will be forever so dominion belongs to god and this just shows forth his glory shows forth his power and his majesty but we also see in verse 2 where it says talking about fear right it says in fear are with him that god is worthy to be feared and, and many people don't like to use this word so there are other words that depict this right we have fear we have dread terror awe, respect reverence it's this idea of just looking upon god as who he truly is, in being in utter awe of God's holiness, in utter awe of God's nature, of who he is as God. But God is worthy to be feared. He is worthy to be respected. He is worthy to be honored. His power demands it. His knowledge creates it, right? Because he knows of our sin. And his holiness brings it. Then the more we look upon God in his infinite nature and understand his glory, we cannot help but to be in utter awe of God. See, there are two responses. Some would look upon God's glory and flee from God. But there are those who would look upon God's glory, seeing who He reveals Himself to be in His Word, and submit to Him, humble themselves before Him, and worship Him. But see, the more you fix your eyes on Christ, the more you will fear Him. It's just a natural response. And the more you will love Him, and the more you will trust him. See, we have this weird picture of fear in our minds where we think that being in fear of God is like a super dreadful thing where we just want to hide ourselves from God, where we just want to make God not really known in our minds. But the Bible talks about the fear of God as, as the way to, to live truly. That to, to, to fear God, to love God, is the highest call of man. Because it is right to fear God, because He is our Creator, He is Lord of all. And if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 through verse 22, it paints a great picture of this truth. It says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, and earth also with, with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, for it, it, it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff naked. For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye, are, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God. That had done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for the multitude. So here in Deuteronomy, it's talking about the people of Israel needing to fear God, needing to love God, needing to obey God. But it's not this burdensome, grievous weight upon the people. In, in a sense, the law does bring that, and that's why we need Christ, absolutely. But to fear God, to love God, to strive to obey God is a great thing because it shows forth even God's faithfulness. is giving them reasons why they ought to fear God. For all these great things that he has done for them. For the deliverance that he has brought forward for them. That God's faithfulness demands our fear. God's goodness deserves us to praise him and to love him and to desire to know him. 
It is the very nature of God that beckons us to come to Him in humility and fear, for He is worthy of it. And if we go to Psalm chapter 86, verse 8 through verse 13, the Bible also says this, Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So again, we see the goodness of God. That We see that he is God alone, and that's why he deserves to be feared. That he has no rival, he has no equal. Therefore, his dominion is forever, and his fear is demanded. But we see that he says, Unite my heart to fear thy name. That, that the psalmist wants to fear God, because to fear God is to have wisdom. To fear God is to have life. To fear God is to do his will and love him. He says, Great is thy mercy, that was deliver my soul from the lowest hell. You see, fearing God is a great thing that brings great joy in a man when he fears God as he ought to. And if we go to verse 3 of Job chapter 25, it just continues to talk about you know, God's power, ultimately. He says, Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? You see, when, when people would look at kings, they would judge their power by the size of their army. And see, while God's army is vast, while God's army is great, God outshines them all. That God does not need angels to do his biddings because his power is infinite. Yet he does have angels, he does have an army that just shows forth his power. And it also talks about his light in verse 3. It says, And upon whom doth not his light arise? Remember in the last chapter, we're talking about men who would try to hide their sinfulness in the dark, try to hide their wickedness in night. But we've talked about how God sees them all. Right? The wicked man may do his wickedness in the cloak of night, yet God sees them as though a spotlight were upon them. That our sins are not hidden from God. God knows them all. And that is why we must come to God in repentance and faith. Confessing our sins before him, for he is a faithful and just God to forgive us our sins. And then we see the, the fruit of our, of our sin not being hidden in verse 4. Where it says, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? How can we be justified before God? How can we be clean? It is the most important question to ever be asked. In light of all of our sin and all of our wrongdoings, how can we be made right with God? You see, many people will try to say, well, I do this, I do that, I do all these good works, I try to live a good and moral life. And they're always pointing to the good things that they do. You know, every man declares his own goodness. But how much more do our sins outweigh our good? How much more does our, our wickedness outweigh our good deeds? But you see, we all suffer. It talks about being born of a woman, right? Or how can we be clean that's born of a woman? It all stems from the very fact that we have fallen because our first representative, Adam, fell. We all suffer from the fall of him. Our very heritage condemns us before God. We cannot be right because of our, because of our nature. All mankind is born in sin, and every individual participates in sin. Every person has willingly sinned against God. So how can we be made right with God? How can man full of sin and iniquity, be right with a holy God of the universe? That is the question that all men ought to ask themselves and that we all must find an answer. And ultimately, that answer is in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, dying for our sins upon the cross and rising again on the third day. And if you look at verse 5, it talks again just about the, the futility of man being made right before God. It says, Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. And as humans, as we look into the night sky, we see the moon bright. We see the moon, uh, the moon being magnified in, in the sky, right? Just because of its sure beauty and, and light it provides. But even further than that, as we look at the stars, you know, light years away as they might be, these things are massive and powerful that no man can really comprehend. Yet before God, they are as nothing. The stars and all their might and light are but dull in the light of God's holiness. Compared to God, all things are unclean and filthy. In light of His holiness, nothing else compares. You see, if, if, a, if a moon and a, and a star provide such great light is but dull in the eyes of God, how much more sinful man before Him? 
And again, we see the same picture in verse 6. It says, how much less man that is a worm and the son of man, which is a worm. And here's the truth. We're all created in God's image. And because of that, we are greater than all of the creations because God has made us that way. But you see, in our sinfulness, we are as worms. You see, if these great creations are as filthy in God's eyes, how much more than man who sins against him? Mankind in its abundance of sin is as a worm before God, utterly helpless and unclean, groveling in the dirt before God. You see, God in his holiness looks upon man in his sinfulness, and he is wrathful against our sin. He is angry at our sin. Yes, we are created in the image of God, but because of our sin, we have fallen and we have become worms who, who cannot help themselves, who cannot make themselves right with God. So I beg you, tell me how your religion saves you. Tell me how your works justify you. Tell me how you can be clean in the sight of this holy God of the universe on your own accord. If we go to Luke chapter 5, verse 6 through verse 8, we see a great uh, picture here with, with, the apostle, or with, the, with the disciple, where I read Peter. You see, Jesus had just told them to cast their net into the sea and to catch the fish. And they obeyed and they did that. But we see a great response from Peter. It says this in verse 6, And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. This is Peter, Simon Peter, before Jesus Christ. And he, he doesn't even, Jesus here doesn't even say anything. But he saw the miracle that Christ did. He saw the miraculous work. And right then and there, he knew that, that Jesus was not just an old man. He may have not fully understood his deity. He may not understood truly at this time that he was the Son of God. But he knew there was something different about Christ. And he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. That is what it's like when you gaze upon God and His holiness and His glory and His majesty. And you look upon yourself as a sinner and you see Him. But you cannot help but to say, depart from me because you know that you do not belong in the presence of God at that time. You know that you do not deserve to be there with Him. Yet a better response is not depart from me, but Lord, forgive me. Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, draw me unto you and show me your grace. But you see, even though we were worms before God in the sense of groveling in our sin, helpless, God made a way for mankind to be saved. And it's not through religion. It's not through works of righteousness, for our, our righteousness is but filthy rags. It's not through keeping a religious duty. It's not through being a moral man. It's trusting in Christ the blameless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, that Christ, being God from all eternity, humbled himself as a man. He put on flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless, holy, good life, one that we can never live. And then he went to the cross. And all upon that cross, he took upon himself the sins of the world. And with our sins upon Christ, he took upon himself the wrath of God that we deserve. That we deserve to be on that cross with the full weight of our sin and being judged by the full weight of God's wrath. Yet Christ took it upon him himself. He died upon that cross. He was buried. But on the third day he rose again, proving that he is God. And that we said is true. And all those who trust in Christ will be saved. All who repent of their sins and turn to him in faith. So I implore you, come to Christ, the one whose blood washes away our sin. The one who cleanses us of all unrighteousness and the one who clothes us with his perfect and pure righteousness. For we cannot be made right with God, but Christ has made a way for mankind to be right with him. And that is through him alone. That there is no name under heaven given among men which you might be saved, but Christ Jesus alone. The man, the God, Christ Jesus. And I, I just find it so very fascinating and interesting that in this verse, in, in verse uh, 3 I think it was, where it talks about the angels, right? That God's armies are, are, are infinite. His, his armies have no number. And they are full of angels, full of power. Yet we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where, where Jesus is being born, we see the heavenly host say, Peace unto man. That while we deserve God's wrath, because we hated God, we were enemies of God, we were at war against God, yet God offers us peace. 
He does not. You know, he offers us a way out of destruction. He offers us mercy, but it's all found in Christ. It's not found in works. It's not found in any other name but Christ alone. He offers us peace through his death upon the cross and his resurrection from the grave. For all those who trust in Christ will have peace with God. They'll be made right with God. Trust him today and be saved. Do not trust in yourself, but trust in the work of Christ alone. I always remember you are not alone. Jesus loves you. I love you. Have a blessed rest of your day.